Thank you for joining us. I'm just going to give it another moment to uh, let in one or two other people, and then we will begin. I just want to make sure that we are we're live on Facebook, and we are recording. Okay, great. All right. Well, listen. Welcome, everyone. It's it's good to see everyone here tonight uh, for our uh, September peer meeting. Uh, I'd like to ask if you would like to drop your town and the organization that you're affiliated with in the chat. I think we might have some people who are joining us from outside the area, so it's always fun to know where everyone is coming from. For those of you who are coming to their peer meeting for the first time, uh, my name is Catherine Soka. Well, PEER is a progressive multi-issue grassroots organization that's committed to advocating for social, racial, environmental, and economic justice for all through electoral politics and activist issue-oriented engagements. PEER is a chapter of the statewide organization NIPAN, New York Progressive Action Network. NIPAN has over 30 chapters and many affiliates throughout New York State and we are a member of them and we are also affiliated with many local grassroots organizations as well as the national organizations indivisible and our revolution our primary focus over the last year or so has been on healthcare election reform immigration and racial justice and the environment so I'm going to put in a plug right now. If anybody hasn't already sent in their peer dues, I'd like to ask you to uh, join the organization. Members can vote on all of the propositions that we've put together. And I'm going to drop in the chat how you can actually do that uh, by sending a check and supporting the US Mail Services to our uh, treasurer, who is Tina. Or you can actually, we've just uh, put together an ActBlue account for people to join peer, so you can link to that. All right, so, you know, earlier in the day, I was thinking back to the first peer meeting we had in the, in the year 2017 after Trump was uh, elected. And the energy in the room at the Bridgehampton National Bank with over or almost 100 people was, was strong. The energy was anxious and we were trying to figure out what we can do to go forward and in the last four years even though trump has continued to play his diabolical uh games we as a grassroots movement have 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 grown we have strengthened ourselves and in in that spirit we are inviting tonight john nichols from the nation magazine to tell us more about what we can do to actually protect our elections going forward so here's a summary of what's going to happen tonight. After some announcements, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Catherine Levy, who is the co-chair of our election reform group. And she and Cheryl Cashin are going to moderate a discussion with John. And after about 45 minutes, we'll pivot to questions from the audience. So you'll be able to ask questions. We ask you to be brief and to use the raised hand icon when you do that. Or you can post a question in the chat if you would prefer. And Julie Sheehan, who is the other co-chair of our election reform, is going to actually call on people to give their, uh, to ask their questions. So just a couple of announcements, and uh, I'm going to drop these things into the, the chat as well. Hang on a second. The first one is our next meeting, which is going to be October 22nd. And on October 22nd, we're going to have four progressive Long Island candidates joining us. We want to try to get in New York State the pro most progressive Long Island candidates we can so that we can actually pass the New York Health Act and other important legislation. So there's Christine Pellegrino who will be with us and three people who are running for the assembly, uh, Joe Sackman, Dylan Rice, and um, help me out. Let's see if the third person is Steve Pol uh, Polgar. Steve Polgar. So that's going to be on the 22nd. And then this coming Saturday, in my other hat as a bookstore owner, we're going to have a Zoom chat with two veterans of the civil rights movement. We will have Janet Duarte Bell and uh, Louis Steele, who both were very involved in the 60s and have continued to stay involved we're going to have a discussion about black women in the in the movement and the um the recognition um and the uh, or the reckoning of white privilege 
So that's going to be on, on Saturday. You can join us for that if you want. Um, other local actions there in the chat are how to get involved in the different campaigns. And I'd encourage you, uh, if you just block copy that and drop it into a document on your desktop, you'll have that for the future. So there's just one more thing that I want to do because as a bookstore owner with a, a, um, a guest who has written a book, I want to encourage you all to support John by getting his new book, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace's Anti-Fascist, Anti-Racist Politics. So you can order it from the bookstore um, and that's, or um, you can get it on bookshop.org. So that's there. And at this point, I would like to now turn it over to Catherine Levy to set up the program for us. Thank you. So before I introduce John, I would just like to say that after our discussion and after the question and answer period, we're going to have a call for direct action and various organizations that you can sign up with, including here. And I can't uh, emphasize how important it is for everybody to be involved in anti-voter suppression efforts, if they can be, in the next 40 difficult days. Um, I could uh, spend a long time introducing John because he has remarkable credits, but I'm gonna keep it short because there are so many things that we wanna talk about today. John Nichols is the National Affairs Correspondent of the Nation and Associate Editor of the Capital Times, the daily newspaper in Madison, Wisconsin. He is also a contributing writer for the Progressive and In These Times. He's the author and co-author of numerous books, including Horsemen of the Trump Op a cop, Trump Acopolix. I'm sorry, John, you can say it. Acopolix. Ah, yes. Acopolix. A wonderful title, a field guide to the most dangerous people in America, as well as the genius of impeachment and analysis of the Florida recount of 2000, certainly books that have relevance to our discussion today. As Catherine mentioned, his most recent book is The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace's Anti-Fascist and anti-racist policies. And I have to say, it's an important book for understanding the current state of the Democratic Party and our embattled democracy. Thank you for writing it, John. And thank you for being here for this critically important and timely discussion. I'm gonna begin with what might seem like a simple question, but given the daily, sometimes hourly twists and turns of this election drama, I don't think the answer to it is necessarily simple. In your view, what do you see as the most significant challenges facing us in terms of voting and having our votes counted in this election? Well, that, that is uh, the, I guess, $2 billion question. Because <laughs> that's about how much we have money we, we've poured into our politics. Let me start by, by thanking everyone for uh, turning up tonight, being a part of this. I, I really want to, uh, give good credit to this group. You're incredibly well organized and you've been great at uh, communicating about uh, being a part of your meeting. So I've, I've enjoyed getting to know some of the folks. I will be furious with anyone who uh, buys the book from anywhere but Catherine's bookstore. Um, in fact, I, I think I'm going to guide all my Twitter followers there and then we'll just, we'll do it all through her and, and, uh, she will reap a great fortune, which I am sure she will redistribute to the community quickly. Um, and uh, I also noted that in the introduction, there was a mention of Christine Pellegrino, who uh, I have written about over the years as a legislative candidate and legislator and someone um, who uh, I, I commend for her great work at, and many struggles within the Democratic Party, within the labor movement and in our politics. So great honor to be with you. Uh, and now after all that, if I can remember the question, I will uh, do my best to, to answer it and to say that in my view, the, the greatest challenge that we face uh, to getting our votes cast and counted is the fact that we have a, a, a completely ill-defined electoral system in the United States. And we don't talk about that enough. The fact of the matter is that our election systems have no there there. They were created uh, at a time when uh, the people who were developing them didn't want the vast majority of people to vote. And uh, so we talk about voter suppression today, but we've got nothing compared to the founding of the country. 
at the, at the founding of the American experiment, uh, we, it is estimated only about four to six percent of the people living in the country could vote. Uh, you knocked off 50 percent right away because women couldn't vote. Uh, then you knocked off uh, people of color, uh, slaves, Native Americans, uh, you know, all sorts of other indigenous folks, and, and so they were all out of the, out of the process. And then notably that at the founding of the country, we had a wealth barrier to voting and indentured servants and people who did not own property were denied the right to vote in many states. It's also notable that around the time of the founding, although it began to, to uh, disappear quickly, we barred people who were not members of a handful of mainstream Protestant religions from participating. And so effectively in the, when we talk about presidential elections and, and congressional elections of 1789 or 1792, 1796, 1800, in that period, the fact of the matter was they were spectator sports. The vast majority of Americans watched them occur because they couldn't participate. And only a handful of extremely wealthy white men did the whole thing. So we've fought civil wars and had you know, incredible struggles over 200 some years and, and opened the process up. But what lingers is that, that structural reality that was actually created at the beginning of the American experiment. We still have an electoral college, which stands in the way of direct democracy. We still have a, a system where the setup for our elections is done at the state level, and in one case, the District of Columbia, um, rather than having a national system. And, and finally, uh, we, even within the states, we have gradations down to the county and the local level, which are incredibly unequal. And so in answer to your very good question, Catherine, I think that's the, that's the number one flaw. That's the number one challenge. And here's why. Because when you have that incredible unevenness, it can be exploited. It can be exploited for political purposes by uh, wealth and power and by incumbent elected officials and their allies. They can exploit it in so many ways, and we'll talk about it as we go along here. But the important thing to understand is if we, if we recognize that structural flaw, then we recognize exactly what Donald Trump is doing. And right now, Donald Trump, you know, when he says, oh, I may not accept the results of the election, what he is really saying is something you know, much more complex and much deeper. And that is, and I, I hope I'm translating for him effectively, that he's not gonna do some kind of coup d'etat. I mean, there's not, you know, the, the tanks will not gather around the White House at some point like that. No, what he's talking about is a constitutional coup d'etat. He's talking about something done within the framework of the American experiment exploiting its vulnerabilities and exploiting its rules as no one ever has before, but as some have tried. And also that, that all through it, whatever he does, to the extent that this happens, and again, we don't know, we can talk more about where the tripwires and the vulnerabilities are, but to the extent that, that he might try to, uh, to interrupt or make a mess of, of the vote counting process and, and that peaceful transfer of power. Um, he will always wrap it in patriotic talk. He and his allies will talk about the Constitution. They will talk about the rules. They will say they are the ones following them. And we, that will be a lie. It will be wrong. But the vulnerability of our system will make that far more possible. And you will even see on CNN when Donald Trump is doing something that is incredibly egregious, if indeed this happens, again, I'm cautious about saying what might happen because we don't know, but let's say something horrible is happening, you'll see a constitutional scholar on CNN saying, well, you understand this is allowed under this amendment and in this way. And so uh, our great sin as a country is that when we opened up the franchise to the great mass of Americans, we did not deal with so many of the structural barriers and flaws that allowed for exploitation of the system. And so we still have elements from 1787 that will be defining our, 
process of determining who the next president is in 2020. Uh, you you actually not only answered the first question, but the second question I was going to ask you. And I would just advise everybody to read Eric Foner's book, The Second Founding, about the attempts to, to redress some of these problems in 1865 and, and how they didn't go far enough. It's an essential book for understanding our problem as voters. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one of the things that I wonder in terms of what's different about this uh, unique figure in political history is his willingness to suggest that various entities should do things that are illegal. Um, so they were floating yesterday the notion that state legislatures could ignore the franchise, they could ignore the voters of their state and appoint their own electors. Now this isn't actually legal in most places, but I'd like to hear your opinion about and you know this is speculation, we're all in uncharted territory. I'd like to hear your opinion about how much illegality you think people in the Republican Party are willing to venture into at this point. Well, uh, I'm lucky in this regard because uh, 20 years ago, or almost 20 years ago, my editor at, at uh, what was then New Press, uh, he's now at Verso, Andy Shaw, uh, called me and he said, you know, I want you to write a book about the Florida recount and, 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 you know, a history of it. And so I wrote a book. Its title is actually Jews for Buchanan. And the reason I titled it that is because if you'll recall in Florida, they had what was called the butterfly ballot. And hundreds of people, you know, marked, it was almost certainly that they marked their ballot for uh, Al Gore more than enough to have flipped the election, uh, Florida, and then the, the election and the presidency to Al Gore. And, but they thought they were marking for Al Gore, they marked for Pat Buchanan. Uh, now, it's no secret that Pat Buchanan has been accused by some folks of anti-Semitism, or at least been criticized for being uh, insensitive. And because that butterfly ballot was in Palm Beach County, um, where you had a, a very, very large community of retired Jewish folks. Um, you have to, if you believe that George W. Bush was elected president of the United States, you have to believe that an, an awfully lot, hundreds and hundreds of Jews voted for Pat Buchanan. And, um, and so hence the title there. And I only give that sort of storyline to uh, say that, that I would caution you a little bit against looking for illegality. And, and suggest that there may well be that, I, I have no doubt, but that the, the biggest problem is, again, exploitation of the vulnerabilities that exist. For instance, Catherine, you bring up the idea of the legislature appointing uh, the electors from an election. You are correct that many states have a, a whole structure in place to have the electors um, chosen, you know, the result of the election, it, uh, an expression of the, the certified results. However, when I was writing about Florida, one of the most fascinating things that I, I learned in the process was that for a brief period, Florida legislators, Republican legislators, uh, when they thought the count in the recount was going against them, going for Al Gore over George Bush, um, this is openly discussed, uh, naming the electors. And what they said was, if there's barriers to that, we're the legislature, we'll just change the law. And so you're right, Catherine, that there are laws in place that prevent them from doing this, except they're the people who write the laws. And so as a result, in many states, not all of them, they would have the potential to pass new laws. Now, this is where it gets really complicated, and I don't want to belabor things too much here, but um, in you may have a state with a Republican legislature because of gerrymandering and a Democratic governor. That An example of that, uh, you have many of the big battleground states are examples of that, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. And, and you say, well, there you'd be, you're safe because the governor could veto it, right? They could veto a, new, uh, a restructuring of the rules there. Well, this is where the courts come in because the Constitution says the legislature does it. Doesn't talk about a governor. Now, we can presume that a governor would have a veto power in that case and could protect the existing law. But uh, if you want to see the rush to the Supreme Court, uh, I will tell you that if, this, if we got into this zone, um, you would have litigation 
that would make your eyes pop. And so um, that's the way, when you ask how far they will go, I think that there are people who would go as far as you can imagine, right? And maybe even a little further, but they will again cloak it in an argument that they are simply working within the constitution. And remember this, this is a progressive group. I make no assumptions about people's politics and uh, one of you may be very conservative and, and, uh, you know, and that's great. I'd love to have the diversity of opinions and diversity of views. But I will tell you that I actually, in writing a number of my books, have spent a lot of time talking to conservative constitutionalists and people who are very into it. And you know, there's a whole bunch of them who don't believe we should have an elected US Senate. They think we should be originalists and go back to an appointed US Senate. So when you get into this question of what, what you or I might see as illegal or, or at the very least wrongheaded, perhaps immoral, um, they will see as following the strictures of or the re requirements of the Constitution. So that's where it gets really ugly, really complicated, and again, not to intersect with the vital issues of this week, I mean, we gather on a day that, that people have been remembering uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, who will go down in history as, as one of the greatest justices on America's Supreme Court. And, and uh, I will tell you that I've read many of her opinions. One of her greatest opinions was, or dissents, was in Bush v. Gore back in 2000. Some of her other greatest dissents have been in Shelby and in other voting rights and election cases. And uh, it is a reminder that as we talk about this, we are looking at the prospect of a Supreme Court that will not have a Ruth Bader Ginsburg on it and may even have her replaced by someone who would be aggressively, affirmatively on the other side of these issues. And so when we talk about, you haven't asked me yet what scares me the most, but frankly, the litigation is what gets really frightening. Well, I, Cheryl wants to ask a question, but just quickly, um, you, I think you come close to what scares me the most. Why don't you say what scares you the most? <laughs> okay, well, that's, and I, and I want to hear other people too. You know, I, I'm, I'm a very hopeful person. I'm, I'm in the school of Rebecca Solnit and, and other writers uh, who believe, I don't believe in optimism, I believe in hope. And that's a big difference, right? Because optimism is sort of starry eyed and, you know, we imagine things to be a certain way. Hope acknowledges the challenges we have, but, but believes that, that we can with the right kind of work uh, and the right kind of uh, focus, get ourselves through even the most difficult challenges. And, um, and so I don't talk a lot about what scares me, but what does scare me um, in this period running up to the election and in its aftermath is uh, a sense of chaos. And it's not a specific act. It is the sense that there is no there, there, there's no touchstone as regards our, our most vital democratic exercise, which is the choosing of our elected representatives and, and the president of the United States. And what I mean by that is not necessarily the chaos that, that some people have talked about. My, my colleague, Sasha Abramsky, wrote a cover story uh, for The Nation about a week ago, you know, exploring, you know, talking to people seriously about, um, you know, the possibilities of violence, the possibilities of disorder in the aftermath of an election, a, a contested election. But I, I worry about a, a sort of a deeper, more structural chaos where tens of millions of Americans really don't know, um, you know how to get out of this thing and where we run into the possibility, and Barton Gelman talked about this in his very good piece for The Atlantic that appeared this week, the possibility, and I've written about this also in, in some of my uh, articles and books, uh, that because of all that vulnerability in our system, it is within the realm of possibility that three people could show up on January 20th with credible claims, not credible to you or me, not all credible to you or me, but credible in their eyes to the presidency. That Donald Trump could do that, that Joe Biden could do that, and that Nancy Pelosi could do that because of the inability of the Congress to name a winner of the election. And at, remember, if there is not a president as of January 20th, Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House is the person who, who presumably in this mess fills in. 
Now, I don't think we're going to get to that. I, I strongly don't believe that we will get to that. Um, but I would hold that out because that gives you the, the, an example of the range of chaos possibilities. And ultimately, I fear that in such a chaotic moment, there might be many Americans who literally say, you know, someone, I'm sick of this. It's overwhelming. Somebody lead us out of this. Hmm. And, and usually in moments like this, countries make very bad mistakes. Okay, your scary scenario is worse than mine. I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. It was not Cheryl, my intent. Cheryl, who usually makes things better, is going to ask a question. <laughs> John, it's very nice to meet you, even though I probably won't sleep for a week. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank you for scaring us straight. Um, I think we need to hear that and we need to really focus. And in this time, the only thing, the only thing that has made me feel hopeful and less powerless is what can we do? And so we wanted to talk to you about what we can do as an activist group, what kind of issues can we focus on to move this, however in, in minuscule steps in, in the right direction, what are other activist groups focusing on, but where can we bite off a piece of this and, and make a difference and feel less powerless? Oh, I love you for that question. Uh, because, you know, that's where, that's really where I want to go, ultimately. I mean, I think we, again, as one who believes in hope, uh, as opposed to, you know, kind of starry-eyed optimism, uh, I think we do have to know what we're up against. And I think that idea of being scared straight, of actually thinking through the most extreme possibilities, which I don't think we'll end up at, um, but then also recognizing that we're dealing with Donald Trump, who has taken us to many of the most extreme possibilities on other issues. And so we, we know that, we recognize it. Maybe that gives us energy to engage, right? That we say, oh, wow, I can't, I am gonna work that extra two hours on this. I am gonna focus on it. So what should we focus on? The answer, and I've spent a lot, I just wrote an article that'll appear in the nation, on the nation's website tomorrow about this. And uh, for those who didn't listen to the plan or to the, the speech that Bernie Sanders gave today, I commend it to you. Uh, you can get the short version in my article tomorrow um, because he didn't, he didn't give a, a speech about you know, what to be afraid of, although it's all in there. It, pretty much everything I've just said is, is in there. Um, he gave a speech about what to do. It was a plan and uh, it's not the whole plan. It's not everything, but there's a huge part of it there. And he actually had five key elements within it when we can talk about some of them, but at the, at the heart of it and at the heart of everything that I've heard in the last uh, several weeks in working on these issues, and I've been working on it for years, but it's last several weeks really focusing on the circumstance we are in, there is one answer. The way to beat all of this, the way to put all of everybody's fears and concerns aside is a big victory. And, and I, I really want to emphasize that. If Joe Biden and Kamala Harris win over probably like 52% of the vote nationally, 53%, and carry the battleground states with margins of, of over 50,000. You know, they don't have to be massive, but you know, they have to be credible margins. Um, this, this debate will, will fade very, very quickly. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I know that there are people who imagine that, uh, that, some, that some of their, their rivals will stop at nothing. I understand that. And I'm not naive about these things. But what I will tell you is that, that for all of the failings of our electoral system and for all the failings of our processes, uh, it does tend to operate within some broad bounds. And so if you've got a clear winner, then you have the likelihood of, uh, of a much more stable process, including a peaceful transition of power. And that has always been true in America. This is, you know, we're not just beginning to visit these issues. In 1800, they had pretty close to a chaos. And, you know, you have, some of you may have been to Broadway to see a play about Alexander Hamilton. And, and the fact of the matter is, Alexander Hamilton was in the middle of a chaos in 1800 that was mind blowing. And that because of one person shifting a vote, uh, making Aaron Burr the vice president, and he also figures in Hamilton, as we will note, um, you know, just to say, this has happened. 
It's been, we've had it. We had it in 1876, uh, and tragically, uh, the chaos of 1876, uh, again, a very close result, a complex result, not, a, not clarity, uh, led to really the end of Reconstruction and something that doomed this country to another hundred years of segregation uh, and, and a diminishing of the process of renewal in, a, in the post-Civil War era. So some of the worst things that have happened in our country have come out of a close result. And the last one I'll mention is 2000, where George Bush and Dick Cheney took the presidency. And within three years, two years, they are, basically, we were in Iraq. And so um, that's what close results get you. So you want to try to avoid that. So what work should you do? Everything. Everything that, that you would regularly do. I know I hate to guide you back into your normal activities, right? But you are a political group engaged in an election year. And so what you want to do is drag people to the polls. You want to get them registered. You want to get them there. Uh, the best tactic I've always said, and it's very hard in the COVID era, but I've always said, if you see a young person, drag them to the polls. And I, and not trying to be nice to young people. I just know the polling data. If young people go vote, they're going to vote liberal on, on average. Uh, and, and so uh, do that work. I, I emphasize that. So one quick final thing, though, on the sense that, that you don't get that big victory. And by the way, I'm not ruling out that that could happen. I think it's within the realm of possibility. We don't know what the polling data is going to tell us and what the reality of our politics is going to tell us, you know, over the next number of days. Uh, if the Republicans try to force through a Supreme Court justice, as I think they will, uh, there may actually be a great big response to that, as there was in 2018. And uh, it, could be, it could be monumental. So don't rule that out. Don't also rule out the reality that we are in the midst of a COVID election, and we are in the midst of an election with mass unemployment in many parts of this country. These are dynamics that usually err toward the opposition party. Um, and so, but with all that said, if it goes awry, the, the thing that I would, would strongly emphasize is uh, be at the ready and be working with your local officials to make sure that the count in your area where you live is done right. And this is what we will ask everyone across America. And, and what we mean by that is that it be fair and honest, that it not be interrupted, that it not be, you know, uh, struck with protests. And there is fears of people, you know, literally, you know, protesting vote counts and pressure on officials. You need to insulate your local elected officials and your local election officials so that they can do their job and do it right. You want to monitor them, make sure that they do do it right, but you also want to make sure that that chaos doesn't press in on them. And that is a big concern for the whole country. Uh, maybe not out on the end of Long Island, but, but it's, that's, I'm telling everybody that your job, your fundamental job, is to make sure that your account is secure where you live. And then one last thing extending from that, if you know anybody in the media, uh, tell them to calm down. Tell them to chill out for a moment and let us get the count right. There's a group called Hawkfish that does tremendous analysis on elections and election scenarios. And they talk about the possibility of something they refer to as a red mirage. And that is the possibility that on election night and in the day or so after, because um, many Republicans will be voting in person, many states uh, will be getting absentee ballots after election day, that if they're stamped on election day, they, they come in, that you may actually have in the initial results, the suggestion of a, of a win for Donald Trump, right? And that he'll be ahead in a lot of states and uh, he'll be ahead in, in vote counts. Now, the reason it's called a red mirage is that over time, as all those absentee ballots are counted, as the mail-in votes are counted, as the slow count proceeds, uh, and as uh, you know, any contested ballots are counted, particularly you know, where people have address challenges and things like that, when it's all done, you will very likely end up with a blue reality, right? So you will move from the red mirage to the blue reality. The biggest danger in that moment is our media. And it's not that, it's nobody trying to do any harm. It's just 
that I, I've come up in newspapering and, and I've posted radio shows, TV shows, I've done election night coverage. I can tell you, you wanna be the first with the information. You wanna you know, go and say things. And you'll always say kind of casually, well, this may not be the final result, but we're getting an indication or we're seeing a pattern here. Well, the fact of the matter is that kind of uh, casual approach, when we know that we have a slow count and we're gonna have a complex count because of COVID, because of massive absentee voting and mail voting, uh, is just, it's incredibly destructive at this point. And so uh, I say as somebody who loves to be the first with the story, um, that the other thing I love is to get it right. And so we ought to give this process the time that it needs to be accurately completed and then report the hell out of that story. It's gonna be a great story, whatever it is, but, but that's the, the last thing I will throw in the mix. Thanks, John. So you gave us a lot there. And it's I'm a lot sorry, of really good advice. No, it's excellent advice. And I think I just want to unpack it a little bit and, and go deeper on, on what we can do. Um, so we've got to win big. <laughs> that's loud and clear. And to do that, we need to turn out the vote. I think that's our traditional work. And we're doing that. The second is that we have to make sure everyone's vote counts. And that's yeah. not so easy to know how to advise people to vote in this moment so that their vote counts. So I want to hook ah. that to unpack that. And then, you know, make sure that we protect the results. And part of that is volunteering and being part of that. But part of it is also the media. And I think we have some questions for you, not just what the media should do, but how should we be consuming media? How should we be talking to our friends and family about consuming media in this time? So let's focus first maybe on this part. How do we make sure our vote counts? And I know Catherine has some questions around that. Yeah. Um Shall, shall I answer initially on how do we make it count? Please. Um, okay. Um, so uh, the great debate, and let's go right to the heart of the matter, is between voting in person or voting by mail. And I speak to you as someone who I think I wrote one of the, there was somebody in Wired, and I give them credit in one of the tech magazines, but I think I wrote one of the first national articles on the need to expand vote by mail when COVID hit. I was writing about it in mid-March and saying this crisis will ultimately be, this health crisis will ultimately be an election crisis as well. It will affect that. And so I've been a huge advocate for voting by mail. I, I believe in it to this day. I think it is vital, but we've had a little problem with voting by mail. Our uh, the Postal Service has been in a bit of crisis because Louis DeJoy has been a, an, an awful postmaster general who has tried to undermine uh, the agency that he's working with. The Trump administration and the president have worked very, very hard to attack vote by mail. And the most serious thing of all is that according to the Brennan Center, we needed about four billion, four to $5 billion to make sure that we could implement all the changes that were necessary to create a, a very strong, voting system that included a lot of vote by mail. We've also had, uh, you know, we know that some rule changes and structural changes needed to be made. That didn't happen. We didn't get the money. Mitch McConnell's sitting on, on those bills right now. And uh, we also didn't get some of the structural changes around the country. We have places around the country right now where voting by mail, you can do it, uh, but the drop boxes, in some places you have one drop box for a county of hundreds of thousands of people. Um, you, if you do by the mail, uh, you have to, there are real concerns about that. Um, and so here's what I say, uh, a good election should have every entry point for people. And you want to make sure that you have the best possible election. They should be able to vote by mail. They should be able to vote early in person, and they should be able to vote safely on election day. And those are our three elements. And so for vote by mail, I still defend it. I still say absolutely, especially if you've got any kind of ailment, any kind of fear as regards COVID. Um, if you just have any structural barrier that you're a working mom or working dad and the day is just hard. Uh, yes, you know, that is, vote by mail is real and good. Here's my only thing, cast your ballot on the first day you can. Don't, don't, it, it, it is, is not a good idea to be, you know, say, oh, well, as we get closer to the election, we'll ramp up our 
encouragement of people to vote by mail. No, tell everybody, if they're going to vote by mail, do it the first day. And I know in my state of Wisconsin, which is a battleground state, um, the ballots mailed uh, last week. And I, up and down my street, I saw them hanging from the mailbox. You know, there, people, were, people were getting it. They were voting that first day. And, um, and that's the right way to do it. Now, if you're not in that circumstance, uh, then early voting, and I don't know enough about, I apologize for not knowing New York's rules, whether you have early voting. Yes, we just, we just instituted early voting in 2018. Go for it. Then early voting is sort of my touchstone. I, it's probably what I will personally do because when you early vote, you get your vote, it's locked in, it's there, it's, it's, it's all settled. And, um, and again, I would argue for early voting early, as soon as you're, it's possible to do early voting at your town hall or library or wherever, I'd encourage people to do it. Um, and then finally, if you're going to vote on election day, I will tell you there are theorists who say that voting on election day is a really, that it's actually a good idea because you know those votes uh, will, and this is in states that don't have early voting, but you know that those votes will be counted. And, and so it's fine to vote on, ele on election day. So I hope, Cheryl, that I didn't you know, answer it every which way here. Um, uh, the fact is, I think all, all three models work, but what I counsel is, in each case, you wanna go for the earliest possible time in which to get your ballot in and, and to get it in the process of being counted. And so that's, that's my answer to that, that first part of it, that, of your unpacking there. Yeah, you, you once again answered a question I was about to ask, but I have many more questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to first ask something that I think you can answer pretty briefly and then get into a more broad area. Um, how many states at this point, I mean, I should know the answer to this, but I don't. Um, how many states at this point are counting their absentee or mail-in ballots as they are received? rather than doing what New York is going to uh, wait until they have all been received. Um, it's, which it's is not why my favorite model. Our primary. Um, That's a nightmare, yeah. Um, and, you know, because you end up, because here's the problem of it. Historically, what, what election officials there are doing there is not trying to screw things up. They are simply going by what they have known in the past. The problem is it's a volume issue that we will have so much more voting by mail, so much more absentee voting, that you end up in a situation where you've got too much. There are just too many ballots to count um, on that day or on that night. And so it becomes very problematic. One of the things you may be able to advocate for, and I don't know if you are, and so you'll have to talk to your legislators, but in, uh, again, some of the upper Midwest states that I've been monitoring a lot, and these are the real battlegrounds, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, um, to give you an example, in Wisconsin, they don't count early, but they have, you, you get the ballots in and then they take them to the polling place. My daughter is a poll worker and her job through the day is to keep feeding the ballots in that day, right? And so they actually have it systematized pretty well to get them counted. And there's a variety of different systems but what you want to do is, if you're advocating, you want to advocate for a system that gets as many of them counted by, you know, the close of election night, so that they're at least they're in the machines. Because once it's in the, in the election machinery, then they press a button and you're going to get a total. And that's, that's where it starts to work. But I, the problem is just the volume. And so then, it, now I'll go to the core answer to your question. Uh, and that is, States are really different on this, and there is a, there's a lack of clarity, there's a lack of there there, and we're gonna end up with all kinds of different circumstances. Some states are allowing uh, mail ballots to arrive as long as a week after the election, as long as they're postmarked on election day. Now, historically, I favor that, right? I mean, you get your ballot marked on election day, you send it in, but the problem is, in some states, they will start counting and keep counting. Those early results will not have all the vote by, you know, they'll have lots of more ballots coming. And that's where you create that red mirage possibility and, and all sorts of complexities there. And other states, there are some states that are talking about holding the whole count until they reach that deadline, right? So then they'll be counting three or four days or five days after the election. 
right? And, and you say, well, that sounds crazy. I can't believe that's ever happened. In Wisconsin, in the primary election this year, they had a six day rule. You could get the ballots in up to six days after. And so we had a Supreme Court election on Tuesday, April 7th. We didn't get the results until the following Monday, April 13th. No results at all. And then on that day, they suddenly all come flooding in six days later. Now in Wisconsin, where we're very polite and very upper Midwest, um, you know, everybody waited, you know, we all went to get some coffee without sugar or cream and, you know, and did the things that we do in Wisconsin. Um, but, uh, what do you think Donald Trump would be saying at that point, right? With a, a six day delay and then suddenly something comes in with a result that he might well lose. Um, I, I, you talk about things I fear. That's one of the things I fear. So the lack of clarity, there are about 20 states, by the way, uh, that allow, you know, some sort of post after election day, they allow ballots to arrive. And within those 20, roughly 20 states, there's a whole bunch of different rules. And if, if, if you're not already kind of, you know, entertaining nightmares for this evening, um, let me offer you one last nightmare. In most of these states, in many of these states, it's still being litigated. I know. There's lawsuits <laughs> in play right now, which could well change what I'm telling you. And so that's what I mean about the chaos, that possibility that all sorts of people are ready to vote by mail, and then suddenly the deadline shifts. And to give you an example of deadline shifting, um, in, again in Wisconsin, in the spring primary, we had a deadline set for initially a couple days after the election. You could get it postmarked a couple days after because there was such a backlog of absentee ballots that they weren't arriving in time. So if somebody had applied for an absentee ballot, but it didn't get there in time. So a judge said, well, you can postmark it up to two days after, right? And so many people are saying, okay, that's good. I'll wait for my ballot. And then on the eve of the election, another court uh, said, I believe it was the state Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court came in and said, no, you can't do that. It's got to be postmarked by election day. There were people who didn't get their ballots. They were waiting for their ballot, didn't get it. And then we were literally having to make, in the midst of COVID, the decision of whether to go to the polling place, even if they were ailing, had challenges. Um, there's a picture of a guy bringing his oxygen tank up two flights of steps at a school in Milwaukee uh, because his ballot didn't show up. I, I was, and so that's I was I campaigning think. for Bernie and making phone calls, and I spoke to many of those people, and they were very torn. They were in torture about what to do, but a number of them Some, said, yeah. another, a number of them said they were going to go to vote, whatever the they did. But, were. but you know what else happened? A lot of people. I didn't. know that. I know that. Yeah, I, yeah, there were people who had. I knew people who were told by their doctors they could not go to the polling places, that you cannot do that, and so there were people who were disenfranchised because of the ballots not arriving because of the change of the deadlines. Um, I don't want to belabor this too much, but I will tell a good story. Um, uh, there's a woman in Milwaukee, uh, and she and her father had a ritual that they always went to vote together. But her father had lots of different ailments, and so uh, they decided to vote by mail. They waited until the afternoon on election day, and their ballots had not arrived. And so they decided they had to go. And so this was early, relatively early in COVID. And so they made their own protective gear, right? They had masks, but they did put other things on. They drove to the polling places. And um, the, oh, to know this story, you have to know that the, the Republican leader of the state legislature is a guy named Robin Voss. Uh, and he's the guy who'd been the big one pushing to not allow for any flexibility on any of this. And so she went, her father went, they cast their ballots. She put her I voted sticker on her mask. And as she was riding away, uh, and she took a picture of this, as she was riding away in the car, um, she was sitting there with her mask on and her I voted, and she had her middle finger up. And uh, she tweeted, uh, F you, Robin Voss. <laughs> well, that's a good story. Uh, 
I, I, I fear bringing up this subject at this late date in the meeting, but I have a few friends who will uh, hate me if I don't, so I'm going to. Um, I, I have to say, I have never seen the kind of debates about how to vote that I have seen this, this year. One of the deb debates concerns the security of our electronic voting machines, particularly sure. the ones who ha that have inadequate paper trails or no paper trails, and the ones that appear to have modems attached to them, remarkably enough. Um, and I have one friend who is on this call who knows uh, Trump is trying to discourage in-person mail-in voting because he believes that those machines in some of the states will be hacked. Um, do you have an opinion about this? And if a voter feels insecure about their electronic voting machine and they're voting in person, do they have any recourse? They do have vote by mail. Um, that is, that is a one recourse right up front. Uh, let me tell you that in reporting a lot on elections, uh, I, there are two sort of conflicting streams here. One is uh, our, the reality that in 2016, there were clearly efforts uh, to get into uh, election commissions and to, uh, you know, kind of break through firewalls and, and such, uh, which have been written about and, and actually quite well documented by a number of writers. Uh, and so there's this concern always. But in 2016, uh, most of them were unsuccessful. They were caught. And uh, there is a, among the people who are, who run elections, there is a very, very high level of um, commitment, if you will, to trying to do this right and to trying to you know, monitor against uh, the threats that, that are posed in this you know, digital era. And so I will say, and this is for me, and I recognize there may be somebody on this call, uh, maybe many folks who are in, in a different camp. Uh, I think that we are pretty secure. You know, and I use underline the word pretty. Um, I don't know. I won't give you a hundred percent promise, but my sense is from interviewing a lot of election officials around the country, there is a sense that they they do have the the equipment and the technological skill uh, to run a secure election. That is my that is my belief at this point. Um, but if I can offer one final thing, whether I'm right or wrong. The problem is we have a lot of people who don't feel secure about our voting systems and who do feel real concerns about them. And this is something that ought to be addressed. There should always be a paper trail. And to the extent that you can fight for that, even at this late date, you should. Um, and one of the, the realities, I, I've been lucky enough to cover elections in 25 different countries uh, all over the world, including South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy, elections in Israel and Palestine and most of the countries of Europe and Southern Asia, um, in Great Britain, Canada. And you know, one of the things that, that's striking to me is the lie of voting machinery. The fact of the matter is there's countries around the world that do whole elections with paper ballots to this day. And I don't mean just one you feed into a machine. I mean paper ballots where you mark it and they count it that night. Uh, I have been to counts in, in Great Britain where uh, you know, you're in a parliamentary constituency, 50, 70,000 people vote. They have a massive room where it's all set up and everybody, they go into a massive count, everybody's doing it and they pass the ballots over and they double count. You know, the United Kingdom uh, historically has uh, a whole election. They fill more than 600 seats in parliament and they change their government in one day. Yes. They literally do it. And so I, think that that at the end of the day I'm in the camp that says if we can't get secure machinery I'm completely comfortable with going back to old-fashioned paper ballots it doesn't I, because I've actually seen it work I'm not romantic about it and and we can't have a circumstance where honest sincere people are concerned about the security of their election again I happen to believe that you know I'm pretty confident that we'll have a secure election in, in that regard, in that structural regard. But um, whether I, again, you know, why listen to me, right? Why listen to anybody? Uh, we should all have an absolute sense of security. And that's, as a group, something you might want to really fight on going forward. 
we got to make it through this election. But that's a great that's a great struggle to have. And New York, by the way, could use a lot of election law reform. Oh, we know that, John. Please. I know, I know. I'm teasing. <laughs> Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I need to get my blood pressure back down so I'm going to talk about <laughs> what can we do. <laughs> so, so we talked about what we can do to vote yeah. so that our vote counts. Um, now I want to talk about after November 3rd, you know, there's going to be this period of time and, and you know, any, any scenario could play out. I would like to hear a little bit what you think might play out, but, but really what can we do in that time? What should we do if some of these um, more difficult scenarios do, do come sure. to play and, and what can we do as individuals, what can we do as an activist group during that period to, to protect the vote, to protect the narrative, whatever else we need to do? I really appreciate you using the word narrative there, protect the narrative, because um, this is actually something I, I, I've got a piece coming out in the magazine that it'll, it'll appear um, actually middle of next month. So it's a, it's a ways off, but it's actually all about the, the fight for the narrative. Uh, and my argument, out of great respect for Donald Trump, um, he is probably the greatest master of controlling the national narrative that we have seen in modern times. There were other presidents along the way who were very good. FDR was brilliant at it. Um, Reagan was pretty good at it, but, but a little lackadaisical. Um, but Donald Trump, we've never had, I, I, I would go so far as to say we've never had anybody quite like it. Um, he masters the narrative on all platforms at all hours of the day and the night. He feeds into it constantly. And over time, he does two things. Number one, he builds up a, a, a sense of confidence on the part of his base. They, they've been fed enough information that they, they know how to argue with someone else. It isn't just that they've got something in their head. They're, they're, they've been trained to, to speak about these issues. And then he also, he manipulates and plays our media. You know, he's great. He always is attacking the media, but it's a, it's a wonderful tool for him because in the effort to be fair, things that are absurd become one side of an argument, right? And so his mastery of the narrative is a big deal. What I would argue is that as a group at the grassroots and through the elected officials that you communicate with, people who you have an ability to reach out to and, and talk to, you have to say that, you know, in this case, because you are advocating for Democrats, the Democrats have to get massively better at controlling the narrative. And that has to come from the top. I'm sorry, we, we have a horrible way of doing it, but we set up a system where the candidates for president and vice president are the dominant voices in a political campaign. We want to see what they're saying back and forth. And um, the simple reality is that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have to be, you know, at the, at the battle front. They have to be ready to go with that narrative. And then all down through the whole infrastructure, down to, you know, where you're living, um, people have to be really pushing that. And I'll give you an example to help you understand why that's such a big deal. And why I think, even though I know some people say, yeah, but I want some precise thing I should do. I want an envelope I can fill or a button I can press. I will tell you the fight, and I'll tell you a couple of those, but the fight for the narrative is much like the fight to get that big win, the fight for the narrative in the aftermath is so vital. Letters to the editor, uh, you know, going on local radio shows, talking to your friends and neighbors, you know, building that up, that has to come from the grassroots up and from the top down. And the example of why that's such a big deal is in 2000, writing the book about the Florida recount, I can tell you without a doubt, without a doubt, uh, Bush and Cheney and Karl Rove won the narrative war. From the beginning, they made the argument that Bush was a president in waiting and that Gore and Lieberman were sort of usurpers, that they were you know, just sore losers who were trying to drag the thing out. They, they owned that narrative and it was so successful that I think it created space for legal rulings, um, for political initiatives, I think it created a confidence for even the interruption of the, the, the vote counting down in Miami, the, the so-called Brooks Brothers riot, uh, where let congressional aides who had come down from Washington literally interrupted a vote count and banging on the doors and things. I think it gave a confidence because people literally thought, you know, yeah, I can get away with this because I'm, you know, my guy won. And I think it created space even up to the Supreme Court. 
And at the end of the day, Al Gore, who did a terrible job of maintaining the narrative through the fight, um, conceded in what looked like a hostage video. You know, I mean, he went up before that microphone and said, yeah, it's all, it's all good, keep the country together. And which I, you know, and I understand the sentiment, but boy, um, that was a failure. Failure from beginning to end. If the same thing happens in a close result, um, you're gonna have a mess, right? And you could end up in the same thing. So I really appreciate their use of the word narrative. Now, let me give you just a couple other core things I sort of mentioned before, so I have to go into detail. Number one, make sure your count. Now, you're not in a battleground state. If New York goes for Trump in this election, uh, or if it's close, I don't think what happens in Iowa or Wisconsin is going to matter. Um, but, uh, but it still matters because I think the popular vote is a big deal. And maxing the popular vote for president does matter. I think that the getting those votes in at the presidential level matters. And I also think congressional races matter immensely. Remember, this is a big deal. And, and, and I, some people don't know the calendar so well. Um, on, the Congress will come in, you know, everybody's going to be seated on January 3rd. Then on roughly January 3rd, uh, roughly January 6th is when they open the electoral vote you know, and start to count all that. If it's a contested election and it's thrown into Congress, right? States vote, they each have one vote, right? And it becomes this whole complex thing. It's a question of whether perhaps the House could withdraw and not cooperate in a joint session. I'm not gonna go into all that, but what I am gonna tell you is congressional races matter. They matter a lot all over the country. And uh, so you wanna make sure that your count works. And you want to make sure that it's secure and that every vote is counted because I'm telling it to you, even though you're not in a battleground state, because I want everybody to, to work where they live, make it, make it work there because if everybody does that, it feeds up into a hole. And um, so that means talking to your local elected officials, talking to your election officials, making sure that things are secure, that there isn't any interruption of the count, that there is, you know, that everything functions as it's supposed to function that it be fair and accurate, and they have the time to do a good job. And then the final thing is, and I make no presumptions about people, how they give money or, or what they do, and I don't tell people how to give money. That's their choices. But I will tell you that there are going to be, you know, this will be an expensive reality. You know, post-election fights are incredibly expensive. They involve lawyers. They involve people you know, being in, in places all over the country, tens of thousands of people can end up engaged in that process. And so uh, I will, again, say there are many places in NIPAN and other people can tell you ideas about this, but um, steering resources to where the battlegrounds are is a, is a very useful thing because the fact is I can tell you right now, you know, I hate to say it, but I can tell you right now where the fights are gonna be, right? It's Florida, always is Florida. Uh, you had one just two years ago in the governor's race, in the Senate race down there. Um, probably Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, Pennsylvania. I'm gonna add Iowa and Ohio into that. I'm gonna throw in Arizona, North Carolina, and then my outside chances, not certain, but, but possible, of Georgia and of, uh, if I'm really getting uh, romantic about it, I might say Texas. And then the last thing I'll tell you, I know that there'll be an inclination here to only think about the presidential race. The Senate is absolutely critical. If, if uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are elected, but they're elected with a Republican Senate, they effectively start as lame ducks. They are disempowered on, on so many issues. And so when you think about all this, we've been talking so much about the presidential race, uh, people should also think about Senate races. And there is every possibility that everything we've talked about with the contested circumstance could play out in a Senate race. And so you wanna look at um, North Carolina, Colorado, Arizona, uh, Montana, North, uh, I'm trying to think of who else is, you know, we can run down the list if you really want to. And then here's something that'll even give you one more reason, not a nightmare, but something that'll keep you up tonight. Um, you've got the incredibly important Arizona Senate race because 
the, the, if Mark Kelly wins that seat down there, he can be seated in the Senate early. That could have consequence, not merely for a Supreme Court choice, if indeed it drags out, could also have consequence for all many of these other issues we're talking about. Um, and then there is also, amazingly enough, a special election in Georgia where Raphael Warnock is running. And the simple fact of the matter is that's not going to be decided until after November 3rd, because the runoff is after. And um, there is, what if we end up with a 50-50, or what if we end up in a situation where it's looking like a 50-50 Senate, right? And what if Georgia becomes 51? And so suddenly you've got something to sweat about and worry about all through November. Thank you for that, Don. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> this is really very specific and very helpful and a lot of action that we can take. Catherine, do you want to add, uh, ask one wrap-up question before we? Yeah, I, I, it's not exactly a wrap-up, but I just want to return to to a, a, a participant in this drama who are incredibly important, and that again is the media. I mean, if 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 the nation and the progressive and democracy now were the media, I could sleep a lot easier every night. But I'd be a lot busier. Well, but it would be good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but but they're not, and we know that even the uh, the sources of information that we think are a bit more balanced than Fox News love sensationalism. They they don't give people enough information about things. I wonder, have you been talking to people in more mainstream media, if you want to put it that way, about the election night and post-election night scenario? And have you sensed that they have any sense of responsibility for their role in it? I mean, I know you even have a, a, you know one colleague for, from the nation who is now at MSNBC, Chris Hayes, and, and Katrina is allowed to occasionally make appearances on mainstream media. Um, are, are you sensing that they understand and their huge, grave responsibility for, for the post-election period? That's a superb question. I'll tell you that I was on MSNBC over last weekend. So it, we, they occasionally, uh, we will be there. And a lot of, and uh, um, Ellie Mistal, who is our justice writer, uh, has been on quite a bit in a lot of places because of um, uh, the Supreme Court pick. So, you know, we end up, and it's not to do some promotion for the nation, but to say that, uh, MSNBC and CNN will allow, there's much, there's a more a diversity of voices there and, and it's imperfect, but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's not an individual, it's not even an individual host, it's the overall kind of sensibility of our major media. And, and it is the competition to be the first. And I have talked to a lot of people in major, in major media outlets. i talked to, including folks at Fox, who I, I know, and I, I will uh, tell you that there are people who work at Fox who are actually, who are tremendous journalists and are very serious about, about the craft. Um, they don't run the show, but they, they try. And there are uh, more people at CNN and MSNBC who would fit that category and all through. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm always a, I tend to compliment working journalists because I think there are a lot of them who do take it seriously and who do feel that they have a duty to do things right. The problem is going to come from the top, and it is that rush to be the first, and throughout the history of media, to be the first to break a story has often proven to be very beneficial economically for outlets. If it's seen that they're ahead of the curve, that they get the news first, um, they they benefit by it, and so that old school pressure is still there, um, and I do worry about it. Uh, with that said, I will tell you that a lot of people I've talked to are conscious of this issue. My colleague Joan Walsh wrote a piece that will appear in the next issue of The Nation, and she is a CNN commentator, and she basically, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put words in her mouth, but she essentially wrote a letter to her colleagues, you know, say, and, and people saying, here's the stuff we really got to think about. And she went through examples of where um, elections were called and they, that turned out to be wrong and, um, and all sorts of challenges there. I commend it to you. It'll be out you know, in, in relatively short order. And I think it's an important piece. And I suspect that others will do that. In fact, I dare say, I, I, again, I won't put words into their mouths, but I think there are a lot of very prominent retired um, 
anchors and journalists, many of whom you know, um, who I believe will step up at some point and perhaps as a group say, you know, here's a set of standards that, that really ought to apply. And so as activists, remember activism, we can be media activists, right? We can be activists on behalf of a better media. And so watch for that. Watch for people that are stepping up and offering standards for how a good election night might be run. And also take a look at Bernie Sanders' uh, speech from today, which includes a substantial section on media and particularly a section on social media talking about you know, where there are particular concerns. Yeah, I, 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 I would advise anybody to listen to that speech. It, it showed uh, some very clear steps that we can take. John, you've been fantastic, but we're going to ask you to hang around for just a bit longer so that you can answer some of Absolutely. the questions. Um, and the question master Julie Sheehan is going to take it from here. We have masterful Hi, questions, lots of them. Um, so I'll just kindly ask you to unmute yourself when I say your name. Carl Gardner has a question about persuading um, reluctant, he called them stubborn Biden vo voters. Sure. Um, should, I, should I answer it or should I wait for Carl to? Carl, do you wanna ask it yourself? It's Carrie Gardner. Carrie, oh, I'm sorry, I could, I missed, I missed the eyes. Carrie Gardner. Carrie, unmute yourself. Hi. Um, yeah, Hi. I, I have many occasions to have these conversations on social media, <clears throat> and it's it's very disconcerting. And I refuse to tell somebody they're a schmuck. I refuse to boat shame them. But I try to reason, and uh, one young woman who I shared, uh, who was a fellow Bernie delegate four years ago, and I actually got her to run as a delegate again this time, and she's so stubborn about this. She's so completely uh, hateful toward Biden and the Democrats at this point, and she's a young Latinx, and I... I I, I finally just said to her in an email tonight, if this doesn't scare you, I hope you can explain this to your daughter when we're living under authoritarian rule. Well, um, it's, I, and I understand your question. And it's, it's an it's a important question. Uh, I agree with you, don't vote shame people. I mean, because at the end of the day, we live in an era, especially in this COVID moment, where we're not meeting in a coffee shop or a restaurant, but we're, we're in a place where you could literally press a button and, and end the conversation. And so you want to, we always want to deal in the area of information and, and ideas and to uh, respect the fact that there are a lot of folks who are very frustrated by our political processes in this country. I, I mean, my book is, is about the you know, 75 years of struggles uh, for the soul of the Democratic Party and my deep frustration that, that when the Democratic Party has pulled its punches and not uh, done the right thing at critical turns, they have doomed people, millions of people, to, to uh, terrible circumstances. The Democrats, not the Republicans, but the Democrats by not pushing hard enough on, on fundamental issues, and we, we know all the issues. Um, and so uh, I, I understand that frustration. Here's where I have come to on this and, and what I have concluded in this regard. At this point, if someone cannot see the threat that exists, when you lay it out to them and when you talk about um, literally what Trump is talking about, and the, the only final argument I always put on it is that we've seen what he has done with a first term imagine what he would do with a second term. And, uh, and don't imagine for a second that it, that it gets better because the Canadian folk singer, Bruce Coburn is right. The trouble with normal is it always gets worse. And so the, the simple reality is you lay that out. And if at that point that person isn't gonna do it, then you go to the next person. That's it. You just go to the next person. And here's one of the important realities. A week spent trying to convince someone that you can't convince is a week lost in convincing 100 people that you might convince. And, most, and our biggest challenge is to get the 
disengaged, the disenfranchised, the disenchanted to, to come into the process. And so it's just a matter of managing your time. I love to debate with people for forever, for weeks, for months, but this is, we're now down into a small amount of time. And I'll give you also one counsel for what it's worth. In 1932, when Franklin Roosevelt won a transformational election, defeating Herbert Hoover and, and really ushering in the New Deal era, et cetera, um, the Socialist Party led by Norman Thomas was, got the better part of a million votes. The communists got you know, well over 100,000 votes. And there were a lot of left parties that, that got very, very substantial votes. And, um, and there were times in 1932 and again in 1936 when there were Democrats who were just pulling their hair off. They were afraid that, that the left was gonna pull so many votes away that it would give it back to the conservatives. Uh, back to the Republicans. And, uh, and yet in those elections, they won landslide victories, right? And so I guess my sensibility at this point is you go for a maximum turnout, drag everybody to the polls. And if there's somebody who comes who casts a vote for a candidate that, a you know, third party candidate or somebody that you're not excited by, um, they will almost certainly be offset by the massive number of people that come, right? By this, this huge turnout. And so the, I guess, long answer to a short question, and that is high level of energy into high level of turnout. And then, you know, we'll let, we'll let, it, we'll let it go where it goes. Awesome. I also, one final answer. Sorry, no, I love it when you say awesome, anytime you like. Uh, but one final element there too, there is a group called Roots Action. If you're not familiar with it, Roots Action uh, is a, a very Bernie type, Bernie Sanders type group. And they've launched a, a big national effort that's called Vote Trump Out. And they're not telling people to, uh, you know, they're not big Biden enthusiasts. In fact, they basically say that the day Biden's elected, they'll be in the streets pushing them to do stuff. But they are saying vote Trump out. And their argument is the best way to do it is with Joe Biden. And so right. take a look at what Roots Action's doing. I think it's a pretty creative way of making some of the arguments. And they've got, I think they've got Noam Chomsky, and Angela Davis, and uh, pretty much everybody you can, not everybody, but a lot of folks you can find on the left who are, who are speaking up. Fantastic and awesome. Uh, I'm gonna group a couple of questions. I know Francesca has a question about the factors that um, play in this election. And Andy, if you wanna follow her with your question about trusting the police. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it's great to Hi, see Francesca. you. Hi, Francesca. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. Wonderful. Thanks for the interview. Oh, it was such a terrific interview. Yes, on Writer's Voice and one of many that we've done. You know, you've, t you've outlined a lot of nightmares for us. I'm and sorry. it's good that you've done that. I, I have, uh, because we need to face the realities. I'm wondering what you think of the counterbalancing forces we've you know trump has been in office now almost four years we've had huge movements develop mm -hmm. um you know not just black lives matter I, it just seems like americans are organizing everywhere and many of them are organizing in progressive grassroots movements whether that be against gun violence uh racism climate change can you what is your sense of the strength of the forces of democracy? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a fabulous question, as I would expect from a great interviewer and, and uh, reader and, and commentator. Um, okay, uh, I think the forces of democracy are stronger right now than they've ever been. Uh, I think we are living in a renaissance moment of uh, organizing and activism. And that organizing and activism takes many, many forms. Uh, I think Black Lives Matter is in the forefront at this point, especially in this moment where we you know, literally are talking about uh, the failure of the Louisville uh, prosecutors to, and the grand jury to uh, bring justice as regards the case of Breonna Taylor. Um, and, uh, and we have so many frustrations there. And I think Black Lives Matter is, it's a, it's a huge movement uh, that extends beyond any organization because it just goes into so deep into the, the uh, 
the fabric of this nation. And I can tell you that in rural Wisconsin communities that are overwhelmingly white, uh, they've had hundreds of people out for Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And, um, and so I think it's a big deal and we ought to recognize that. I think the Sunrise Movement right now, the, the, again, a very uh, youth-oriented, youth-led movement uh, is way underrated uh, for its political heft and, and thrust and power. Uh, I think Ed Markey is going to continue another six years in the US Senate because of them and because of AOC. Um, and so they're there. I also think there's a revitalization of the labor movement not in every case, but I, all over the country, I see organizing coming. And I think the COVID moment has made people realize you know, how important it is and how vital it is. And I could run down the list, but the bottom line is uh, people are better organized, better connected, and they know each other. And we are beginning to get a, a, a sense of intersectionality that is real. Intersectionality, uh, a great concept that, was, that has existed for a long time, uh, is now really, you know, it, it's, it's, it's becoming something that works. And so people understand that old, very old concept of the, you know, IWW and groups like that, that an injury to one is an injury to all. And that if your buddy's getting hurt, you have to go and help them because they're going to come and help you in the next fight. We're seeing a lot of intersection between the climate movement and uh, Black Lives Matter as an example, labor movement increasingly as well. And so I think it's there. And you're right. That, I think that is the answer um, to many of the questions we're asking. And it is notable that there are people, our groups like Indivisible and others, that are organizing toward um, you know, the, that post-election moment and to be ready to respond. There are you know, millions of people who have already signed up to, to you know, go to the protest and, and pass the petition and do the thing that's needed. All of that matters. And do we have the ability to counterbalance something that we don't want? And also maybe, much more importantly, maybe to advance something that we do want. Um, I would say yes. And I just keep telling you, you know, look around the world. South Korea is a place where um, they had immense corruption, a huge crisis, and the people, the people did it in the streets um, with mass movements and uh, civil disobedience, nonviolent, and it was effective. They, they changed their government. Uh, and we were seeing it in other places around the world. Uh, you know, look, uh, I don't know where we're gonna end up. Uh, I hope that we have a, a, an easy, positive, peaceful transfer of power. And, and I think we may. I think that's well within the realm of possibility. But I know that if we have an easy, peaceful, functional transfer of power, on January 20, these movements are going to be needed more than ever. Because the fact of the matter is that um, you are electing in Joe Biden, someone who has historically been you know, a man of the center, a, a, a person of a, of a certain wing of the Democratic Party. I think he has signaled in some ways that he recognizes that he would become president in a much more challenging moment and one that would demand him to rise to that moment, but uh, the movements will decide whether that happens, not, not any particular politician. And I always remember the story of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and it is said, although we are not always sure, there's many, it's told many different ways, but it is said that in conversation with A. Philip Randolph, the great leader of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and the you know, pioneering civil rights activist, uh, that in response to pressure uh, from people who wanted the administration to go left, to do more. Uh, Roosevelt said, go out and make me do it. Uh, I think that's, in reality, that's about what you get from a democratic president. If you're lucky, you get somebody who says, go out and make, make that president do it. And then it's on you to go out and do it. Luckily, I believe our movements are, are as strong as they've been, certainly at any time since probably the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. Great. Andy, do you want to ask your question? Andrea Klausner, Andy. Mm -hmm. And after her will be Robert Buonaspera, Spina, sorry, and Gina Ironside is after him. 
Um, thank you, Julie. Um, you got one letter wrong in my, my question, though, it was actually about the polls and not the police. Uh, <laughs> although I am concerned about the We police. can talk about all these issues. Yeah. First, I want to just say, John, thank you for such an informative evening. Um, it, it really uh, gave us a lot of food for thought. Um, you talked about the difference between hope and optimism. And mm. I go on a daily basis, as I bet many of you do, from wanting to just stick my head in the sand, feeling a total sense of futility and hopelessness to feeling activated and sitting and writing 50 postcards and making calls and all of that. Um, I need something to hold on to, and yet I don't want to become too comfortable. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion about the polls. Obviously, the polls got it wrong in the last election. Do you feel that we can at least look at the polls as a reason to feel hopeful? Yeah, uh, that's a really great question and, and right goes right to the heart of the matter. Um, the polls didn't get it as wrong last time as a lot of people say. This is the interesting dynamic. It, we evolve, we grow, we, we learn more, we learn how to analyze better. And we learned a lot from the 2016 election. One of the, the problems in the 2016 election was the sense that the national polls were good, right? They showed Hillary Clinton ahead, Donald Trump behind. And everybody was like, well, there you go. And, and they just assumed that that would filter down into the battleground states. A Couple of factors, it, it, just to give you a grounding on this. Um, the national polls weren't as wrong as people said. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 3 million votes. And so remember, she actually did have a lead. And so those polls were, they were, I think some of them were overly optimistic, but they, she still did have a lead. And in the battleground states, there were a lot of polls that, that should have given people pause, but I think people were, I think there was a romanticism almost. They were just assuming that it was gonna be okay. Uh, and a lot of people who just couldn't believe Trump could win. And so they, they kind of overlooked, they saw too many polls at, in battleground states as outliers because there was indication that, that Trump, I remember I did a, I, I did a Sunday before the election uh, TV show and I was talking, the host said something about who Clinton would have in her cabinet. And I said, you know, maybe we should just pause here because it is possible Trump could win. And, and people laughed at me and I was not being patient. I was just kind of a little bit of caution there. And the host of that show always comes back to me and says, oh, you predicted Trump could win. I didn't predict he could win. I just, you know, kind of pulled back. And I think that's the way that we should approach polls now. We should always have the caution that tells us that even if you're seeing polls that are encouraging to you and they're better now, they're better in this cycle by and large, more encouraging, than they were in 16. They're, they're at the national level and in many of the battleground states, you're seeing some you know, pretty favorable numbers for Biden and Harris. But uh, two things that I would put into that, and then we'll go on to the, whatever the next question is. Um, the first thing about it is that uh, we don't have the cushion of the third parties this time. In 2016, you had Gary Johnson and the Libertarians running up a huge vote and Jill Stein and the Greens running up a, a credibly substantial vote in states all over the country. And that took a lot of, of voters out of the mix. And a lot of analysts weren't paying attention to that and understanding it. I don't happen, I don't blame third parties, by the way, for uh, you know, Trump becoming president. I blame an under, under participation. I think people who vote for third parties vote for third parties because they believe in them, at, or at least it's, it's the choice that they have made. And I, you know, I, I just don't, I don't think that's a logical way to, to argue about these things. I think the bigger one is mobilization. And I think the mobilization fell flat in a couple of the battleground states in 16. Um, and so the polling models this time are different because I don't think you're gonna see a substantial a third party vote. And uh, so then we're going into something that's closer to a real approximation of where it's at. I think that can give you a little more confidence. But the one final thing I will say at this point is that if you're looking at a 3% undecided in that state, in some battleground state, you should probably add it to Donald Trump's total. Because the fact is that Donald Trump is a incredibly controversial figure. He's a figure that arguments begin just at the mention of his name. 
And I happen to believe that there's a, a slight under polling for Trump. And so if he's at, if, if you're seeing a state like a, a Michigan and it's 50 for uh, Biden and 46 for Trump with 4% uh, undecided, I'd hate to tell you, but it's probably very close to tied. And so just that, that, that's my, and I, I'll be glad to be proven wrong, but my gut instinct is that we don't have the traditional undecided breaking both ways that undecided in polling at this point in a lot of places is probably disproportionately uh, people that lean toward Trump. Thank you. Robert, you're up next. To yeah, ask. I'm actually changing my question. Um, hey, Robert. I'm Hi, I'm a history teacher. And I work with colleagues of mine who teach history. And they don't see history the same way I do. So I need you to help me with this. I'm seeing parallels with Donald Trump and, and Adolf Hitler, like all over the place. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? <laughs> Am I, are they right telling me, no, no way could he ever be like a Hitler? And I'm thinking, I know Hitler got elected into power. He, mm -hmm. And already Donald Trump has already got elected once. If he gets elected twice, are we heading towards a, you know, a fascist oligarchy? And which one might argue we already are there, but does it so, become official? Well, you have asked the big question, my friend. Um, and I will tell you that I, uh, I have, rather than giving you a super long answer, I'll give you a, a long enough answer, but rather than giving you a super long answer, I have a book to recommend to you. And, and I definitely believe you should get it from your local bookstore. And it's called The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the book I wrote. Um, because it, the reason I wrote that book was that in 1944, Henry Wallace, Franklin Roosevelt's vice president, wrote a essay called The Danger of American Fascism. And in that essay, he argued that uh, coming out of World War II, we would uh, tell ourselves that we had beaten fascism, but we should be very, very careful about that. Because the fact of the matter is that authoritarianism, totalitarianism, fascism, however we want to describe it, takes many, many different forms in many, many different places. And so, um, you don't have to look for some authoritarian dictator from the past to explain the present. What you have to, and, and trying to find those historical parallels, I know you're a historian and I understand the desire, right? But uh, what I will counsel you is that, that, that that's, and I go off Wallace's essay on this and also a lot of other writing on this, that's a mistake. What you really want to do is look at the, the core concepts of authoritarianism, totalitarianism, fascism, and ask, you know, how do they, how does that happen? How does, how does uh, economic or political power take precedence? And how do you end up in a situation with impunity, a situation where um, the person in power writes their own rules? Because that, to my mind, is, is a, a core definition of a totalitarian circumstance, right? That the person in power says, oh yeah, I know that's the law, or I know that's on the books, but I don't do that, I'm gonna do it this way, right? And, um, and to my mind, with Donald Trump, he has crossed many of the lines already. I mean, sending unidentified troops into Portland, or federal forces into Portland, Oregon? I mean, wh what is that, right? And I will point out that Ron Wyden, the senator from Oregon, um, you know, and uh, Larry Krasner, the prosecutor from uh, Philadelphia, Josh Call, the attorney general from Wisconsin. These are all, you know, very mainstream, very, you know, people in positions of authority, all used terms like quasi-fascist, you know, fascist type tactics and stuff like that. They were a little cautious in their phrasing, but they, they were using the F word, right? So if we if we understand that it is possible to have it, you know, even in the midst of democracy, right? Or even in the midst of a relatively free society that you can have a totalitarianism or an authoritarianism come in and begin to implant and begin to throw off our systems. And maybe most of the times those in power will obey the rules but they have the sense that they can rewrite the rules for themselves, right? That's the fear we have. That's the fear that I write about a lot in my book, 
because I think that's that's an underpinning. And my biggest counsel in this regard, my biggest counsel is that's why you want to have a, a clear election result this time. You really do. And you want that, you know, if you don't want Biden, if he wins, to win by a little bit, you want him to win by enough where there's some clarity, not just about Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, not just about Democrats versus Republicans, but clarity that this country doesn't want a president who thinks that he or she can write their own rules. And I think that's what's at stake right now. And I, I love your question. I love the, the heart of your question for it, because I think what we're really voting on is what, again, I steer you back to Sanders' speech. What we're really voting on is not Biden versus Trump. It is Trump versus a clear sense of American democracy and how it ought to operate. And uh, I do think that's what's at stake. I think that Bernie Sanders was right in laying that out. I don't think that we benefit by going back to the 1930s necessarily to look for our examples. Um, I think we can look you know, right now and we can find that we live in a much more sophisticated era uh, with very different kinds of communication. And as Henry Wallace said, the American fascist won't you know, be dressing up in some kind of you know, uniform with epaulets and all that. The American fascists will look to poison the channels, this is his phrase, poison the channels of communication so that ultimately the American people um, will accept that which would historically been, have been unacceptable to them. And I do think that speaks to the moment we're in. So our next two questions, which are connected with each other, will take us from these lofty principles <laughs> down, back down to the trenches of some of the things you've talked before. Gina Ironside has a great question about insulating the Board of Elections. And Sandy Solomon, if you want to ask your question about counter narratives to fraud and vote in. Hello, good evening. Uh, I am very concerned to um, do what we can after the election. And as you did mention insulating the Board of Elections, I wonder if you could ex give some ideas about the mechanics of that. And I did put in the chat um, two groups that, that I found. One is um, putting out a whole manual on things to know to prevent a coup. I think it's very effective. It's at choosedemocracy.us. And they're using historical examples of people coming out into the streets and not attacking anybody, but just really hand standing there saying, we're defending democracy anyway. But um, I'd love to hear Mr. Nichols' comments about what he has in mind about insulating the result, the count. Thank you. First off, let me honor you for wearing your mask. We all should be, right? I, we take them off at home sometimes, but I, I appreciate it. And, and that is such a vital part of this struggle. And um, we, we literally are arguing with people about wearing masks, in, at least where I live, out in the middle of the country. And so let's talk about this for a little bit. Uh, I really, really recommend the article that my colleague Sasha Abramsky wrote. Uh, it's a cover story in the nation. You can get it on the website very easily. And uh, I hope I don't misparaphrase the title, but it's something like, you know, is, is Trump plotting a coup d'etat? And, uh, and he doesn't say yes, he doesn't say no, but what he does do is talk to a lot of people who are organizing around and thinking about these issues. And uh, in many of these groups that you're talking about are, are in that article as well. It may introduce you to some other groups. And so rather than I going through all the different organizations that frankly are already working on this and, and looking to organize, uh, check it out and, and ponder. I'll write some more about it as we get closer to the election. Uh, other people will be as well. But I do think that, that uh, individual action is always great, but, but uh, communal action where we're working with other people is, is invariably stronger. And so find the groups that, that uh, as you already have, Gina, Find the groups that they, you know touch your heart, touch your mind, and uh, and link in with them. Maybe link your group to theirs and and follow some of that good counsel. Now, as regards insulating your election officials, here's what I would say: Number one, get to know them, know who they are, and 
be a friend to them. Maybe you already are one. <laughs> and, but be a friend to those folks. Be an ally to those folks. They're going to have, this is a challenging election year. You have to worry about, you know, massive turnout, probably more than usual. You have to worry about COVID. You have to worry about all the other challenges that go into it. And then we have this question of a contested election or an election in which there's just a lot of tension around it. So simply being present as allies and friends and just saying, you know, look, I know it's a hard job. Um, you know, we, we want to support you in this. We want to make sure that there is a fair, honest count. And that's, that's where we're at. Now, if you run into a horrible player who's not doing a fair, honest count, you know, call them out and get, get the lawyers in, of course. But by and large, you're going to find the people doing elections are sincere people who want to, want to make it work, but who could be overwhelmed in a moment where there's just a lot of pressure. And what I mean by pressure is the suggestion that because the count is slow, that somehow it's fraudulent because uh, there's a review of ballots, maybe a recount or whatever assessment that somehow um, some dishonesty will sneak into that. The suggestion that mail voting is you know, somehow lawless. You know, all of the things that may be in play. Remember, you have the President of the United States saying this stuff. You have media personalities saying this stuff. And you have the potential that your local election boards could face pressure demonstrations, uh, you know, just harassment, whatever. And if you're ready for it, and if you're up for it, you know, be the, be the, the, the force in your communities, peacefully, nonviolently, that says, you know, look, we're here to defend democracy. We're here to make sure that we get a fair and honest count, and that every vote is counted, and that it functions. And, uh, and people power matters a lot in that regard. And so, yeah, there may be a demonstration. It may be very optimistic and very upbeat and, and happy and just say, thank you, poll workers. Thanks for doing the work you're doing. And, you know, maybe you bring them cookies if that's not a bribe. I don't know. But, uh, uh, but the bottom line is that getting to know them, providing support for them, insulating them in the case where there is pressure, uh, and, you know, basically uh, making the people who do the count heroes. Do it in your letters to the editor, do it in your calls to radio stations, do it in your communications. Uh, if you're a member of a church, synagogue, or mosque, maybe get it into the, the bulletin on you know, Saturday or Sunday or whenever people are gathering to don't forget to thank a poll worker, you know, or, or whatever. But and I, and I don't want to seem you know, naive or, or you know, rose-colored glasses about this, but that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a very human, on-the-ground connection. That, that counters harassment, that counters pressure, and that simply says, you know, you're not alone here. This doesn't have to fall apart. This doesn't have to go bad. Now, it happens, you're in New York State. So it probably won't be as difficult unless you end up with a very close result in the Lee Zeldin race or something like that. Um, uh, but I say this to everybody because it's a national reality. And that when I mention that national reality, it's vital for you folks uh, because you have telephones and co computers and all those other things to support and sustain folks in battleground states who may be, you know, really, sorry, who may be in really complex struggles. Um, and so a lot to get engaged with here, but that's what I mean by insulating. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. And we're, we're taking up so much of your time and you actually addressed the other person's question. I know Catherine Soka had a question and we also want to end with our actions. Um, so Catherine, why don't you take it from here and peace out from me. Hey, Julie, thanks for managing that so well. And what's <laughs> your cat? What is your cat's name? Oh, geez. Tanya. Well, I saw Tanya wander yes. through and I like she that is my co-manager. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you, Julie. Really appreciate that. And uh, John, thank you so much for all that you've shared with us tonight. You've given us a lot of information and a lot of reasons to be hopeful and a lot of things to do uh, in, in that vein. Um, 
the question that I had has been answered. I think at this point, what I want to do is to underscore your desire for us to work locally. And so I'm going to again drop in the chat how we can work on a local level to make sure that we are supporting um, both our Nancy Goroff for uh, in her run against Lee Zeldin. I'm just copying everything right here. So hang on just one second. <laughs> And also that we really work to try to get out the vote for Biden and, um, and Harris. And I want to go over the states that you said are going to be closed states. Yeah. So that everybody knows them. North Carolina, Colorado, Arizona, Montana, Maine, uh, the special election in Georgia, and Kansas. So those those, are Senate races. And, those are Senate uh, races. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and true. Iowa, don't forget Iowa. If I didn't, if I didn't mention Iowa, Iowa is becoming a real battleground, and it looks like it might be the one. Um, and remember, in Georgia, there are two Senate races, uh, both a, a regular cycle and a special election. And uh, then, weirdly, and I know this is crazy, but uh, well, I'll just say it this way. I'll say it another way. Uh, we've given you a list. That list could alter as we get closer to the election. I believe that the Supreme Court fight uh, that we're about to have, I hate to say it, but I think we're about to have it in, in very rapid real time, could affect uh, races in other states. You could expand the list of Senate races. And one, I know you're gonna all look at me cross-eyed, but um, keep an eye on Alaska because there is a uh, independent candidate uh, who has got the backing of the Democratic Party up there, he has just raised a stunning amount of money since uh, Justice Ginsburg's passing. And, and that's, that makes it uh, a, a more real race. And uh, it could be a, a surprise pickup. And remember, Alaska had a Democratic senator you know, not that many years ago. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Two other states I'll keep in the mix for you. South Carolina, where uh, Jimmy Harrison's actually, you know, he's keeping very tight with Lindsey Graham down there. And I think South Carolina is on a slow cycle toward becoming a more competitive state. But you know, every, every cycle we see one that comes across and so it's worth paying attention to. And look, I think Mitch McConnell continues to be ahead in the race in Kentucky, but uh, the people will keep an eye on that Kentucky race uh, just because of who he is. And, and that's, that's another one on your list. So I, I hate to keep expanding it and being an accordion here, but uh, I watch the Senate races closely, and I have seen things filter up that were unexpected, and there may still be a few more unexpected ones. Well, when we get that massive turnout in order to make sure that Biden wins by a clear majority, you know, that will help all of those Senate races. And I think all of us will work both locally and some of us will have some energy to put into national races. So that's a great list to have and a great list for us now to share with the people that we know who are activists. And I wanna make uh, mention one other thing and then turn it over to Cheryl, who I think is gonna close it out. But one thing we can all do locally is to be a poll watcher. Sue yeah. Hornick is trying to put together uh, a, a, a large group of people who will work on election day throughout Suffolk County to make sure that the poll watchers from the Republicans who we've heard uh, some very uh, sort of cautionary stories about will not be able to intimidate voters. So I've just dropped Sue's email in the chat. If you would like to be a poll watcher or you would like to put it out to other people in the county to ask them to poll watch, please contact Sue Hornick. There's just a two hour Zoom training that will occur uh, probably in the next week or two. And then you will be able to help us um, on election day. So Cheryl, I think you have some slides you wanna share and maybe you could even drop that document into the, or that file into the chat for people to grab. Thank you again, John, you're awesome. Thank you so much. I've really appreciated being with you. I don't know if you want me to stay around for your calls to action or not. Yeah. Why don't, you why don't you stay around for five minutes? But I just want to oh, say- Oh, five minutes is fine, yeah. What, what a delight for you to be with us tonight, John. It, it was just extraordinary. And I love the historical component that you brought into the discussion. I think that's very important. Thank you so much. Thank I think you, you helped us be um, just panicked enough and <laughs> maybe even a little hopeful at the same time. So that's a good- I benefit. want you to be, hope is a much more powerful motivator than panic. It really is at the end of the day. It keeps you working day after day. Panic just is good for the moment. 
this is a this is a group of activists who work believe me so um, it, but it is good to sleep occasionally as well so that's good <laughs> I would also like to thank you, Don. I was that that sweet spot of being activated by by the reality, but then having hope and having some very specific things that we can do. So thank you. I learned so much tonight and have a lot more ideas about about what we can do as a group. Um, we just put together a few resources about how to make a plan to vote. Everyone, everyone needs to make a plan. So we we have some tips for that. Once you are voting in person, knowing your rights, and then some ideas for action and I think that list will grow a lot after your talk tonight we will add to that but just to get some ideas out there for people to be thinking about as they leave this meeting tonight we'll just run the slideshow on a loop as you're exiting and then we'll make this available and we'll actually add to it from some of John's suggestions but thank you so much it was really an inspiring evening and we're ready to get to work so I just want to, to add, um, Peer has an election group and we've been working on various election reform issues for the past two years, but we are putting together a special action group for this election. And we are going to be doing a number of things, researching action around the, around the country, because as John has made clear, and we, many of us know, every state is a different challenge. Um, disseminating information on social media and elsewhere, recruiting volunteers who are willing to go to swing states, and spearheading volunteer actions. So what I would like people to do, I'd like to take uh, a leaf from the Sunrise Action Group and say that everybody who wants to volunteer in this special action group, could you put I will volunteer in the chat right now? We will collect your names and we will make you part of the effort that we're going to put on for the next month. I don't see a single one. Come on, guys. Ah, there, Julie starts us. Well, in any case, please, please think of doing volunteer work to uh, help fight voter suppression across the country. We're going, to, we're going to be focusing on that quite a lot. Thank you all very much. Okay, Cheryl, I'm sorry, were you going to, there we go, great. just want to say there's a great um, online portal now to request your absentee ballot. Just Google New York absentee ballots and it takes two seconds. It's great. And for everybody, we are going to be um, expanding these resources in terms of groups to donate to and groups to volunteer for throughout the month. So keep checking on the peer page for that. I, I guess that's a wrap, right? Yeah, yeah. so Cheryl, thank you. Cheryl, if you could maybe Please, stop sharing your screen. Good. Cheryl, if you could stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. And I don't know if you have, but please drop that uh, document into the chat, Cheryl, if you could do that. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Okay, all right, I can do that afterwards. Everybody can stay around. Listen, John, Christine Pellegrino has just joined and she, um, she oh. wants to just send her greeting to you. I believe she did. Uh, Christine, are you with us? I'm here. I've been watching on um, on Facebook. I'm so um, glad to see everybody. John, your um, inspiring words and call to action always um, hit right to the heart of where we need to be thinking nationally, thinking locally. Um, it's so good to be with you and for you to be here with us. Um, we, sometimes in New York, we think our votes don't really matter. No, they um, do. They absolutely, absolutely do. 
and I want to thank you for your for your words tonight. Inspiring. Chris, Christine, you're one of my heroes, and I've loved uh, watching you rise politically, and the fights you've been in, and they've not been easy. I know that, but uh, I've been really honored to know you uh, a little bit in person, but also from afar. And so uh, keep it up. And, and you've got a great, great group of uh, allies here and people you're working with. And uh, maybe that's the best place for me to circle around and, and just in 30 seconds say, uh, I passionately believe that New York and California and other states that are not closely contested this year matter in an immense way. Because I do think that the popular vote will be noted it's not necessarily definitional, but remember, I don't, I don't think we're gonna to go to the nightmare scenarios. I don't think it's gonna be all, many of the things we've talked about here. But if you do get there, then what you wanna be able to point to is, you know, you're out of the electoral college. Remember, if, if an election is thrown into Congress, you're beyond the electoral college. Now you're back to what is the will of the people. And so in your nightmare scenarios, you circle back to the point where the popular vote has potentially have great meaning. Not, not to those who can't be convinced, but perhaps to those who can. And so uh, I know that, that that New York ballot might go into a total that is very, very influential as regards the future of the country. So that's, that's my, uh, my you know, New York state of mind sensibility. John, I hope somebody will write an article just focusing on that issue for the nation because I have been trying to convince my fellow leftists of that and they need to hear that loudly and clearly. If someone writes that article, I will share it all over social media, I promise you. I will share I'll it do, many times. Maybe I'll do that for you. That'll be, that'll be my... <laughs> thank you very, you. very much. That would be great. <laughs> Listen, John, thank you again. We really you. appreciate your time and your passion. And I want also to, once again, I just dropped in the chat, we need to get Christine Pellegrino in our New York State Senate. Thank you for joining us tonight, Christine. Uh, we've got your website there for people who want to volunteer or donate. And she will be with us October 22nd, along with the three assembly uh, Progressive Assembly uh, candidates who are running on Long Island. So I guess that's a wrap. And uh, so everybody uh, stay strong, stay hopeful and stay active. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm ending our Facebook and I'm ending our recording.